What's up, everybody? Welcome. Won't you join us today as we worship? I'll praise in the valley. I'll praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm shown. His roar is 
my triumph. Yeah. I'm going to the land he'll show. Burning all the ships, no retreating. Come on, cause my father's on the move.
Hey, I want to welcome you again to CCV, whether you're physically here on campus or you're tuning in online. My name is Travis Brown. I get to serve as one of the pastors here. And let me tell you something. God has been on the move in and through our church, especially in the next generation, in our kids and our students. This past week, we had our kids camp. You can clap for that. Yeah. This last week, 
We had our kids camp, and across the valley, we saw over 3,100 fourth through sixth graders attend kids camp. It was amazing. It was, it was loud, but it was also amazing. This coming week is our junior high camp. We just ask that you would just continue to pray for all these junior hires who are getting ready to experience camp and that God would move in incredible ways in their lives. Be praying for their coaches who do so much to, to pour into them. And if, if you're here and maybe you feel a prompting, you're like, man, God has been calling me to, to use my life to pour into the next generation. There is no better time to get involved than now. And the easiest way to, to sign up to serve to do that is simply to text the word serve to 72020. That's the word serve to 72020. What will happen is you will receive a text with a link. You can click on that link, fill out that form, and then submit that form, and we will follow up with you and help you take that next step so that you can join God in what he's doing in and through this church. Well, let me ask you a question. Where do you turn when life gets hard? I mean, where do you go when you're angry or you're feeling shame? Is there any source of strength that you can turn to? Well, this week, we're excited to be kicking off a brand new series where we're going to be diving into the book of Psalms. And we're going to see how God meets us in whatever season we find ourselves in and how we can experience God no matter what we're going through. And so right now, we're getting ready to hear a really powerful message from one of our teaching pastors, Mark Moore, as we kick off this brand new series simply titled Psalms. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But you, Lord, are a shield around me. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. He leads me beside quiet I call waters. out to the Lord, and he answers me. The Lord is my light, and the one who saves me. His holy mouth. Whom should I fear? I lie down and sleep. Even though I, I walk through again. the darkest valley, the I will fear so Have so mercy well. on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to feel free to share your answer if you came with someone they're sitting next to you. Here's the question. When you get mad, you get upset with someone else, family member, a sibling, a spouse, when you get mad, are you a powder or a shouter? Share. You, you, want, you want to guess what I, what I am? Anyone take a guess? I am 100% a powder. And I'm, mar and I'm married to a powder. That, that's a bad combination because like, we can hold on to frustration like camels hold on to water. I don't want to brag, but we can go like weeks without really saying what we're feeling. The, the other one knows, obviously. But when you can't share your feelings, we you can't be honest, that's, that's, that's tough on a relationship. I don't know if it's worse or better if you're a shouter. Because some of you, you're not powders, man. You let it all out. You don't just speak what's on your mind. You speak mindlessly. <laughs> Morgan Wallen wrote a song about you. It goes a little something like this. Uh, last night, we let the liquor talk. I don't remember everything we said, but we said it all. Some of you just want to say amen right now because that's the life you're, you're living. Sometimes it's really hard to, be, to manage our emotions well. And that's what I want to talk about in this series because there's a whole book of the Bible and it's right, like it's in the middle of the Bible and it's the longest book of the Bible, Psalms. And it deals with every gamut of emotion that you feel, fear, estrangement, betrayal, love, joy, peace. God has given us this book. It's actually not just one book. If you look carefully, there's five books of Psalms. Categorized, right, like right next to each other. And it's not really a book, is it? It's a collection of these poems, or more technically, they're songs. 
that were to be sung because God knows that sometimes music gives wings to our emotions. And through these songs, we're able to express to God what's really on our heart. That is so, so important. Now, I know there's a lot of dudes in here that's like, ah, I don't have emotions. You know, it's, it's, just a good, it's for sissies. Well, let me just tell you that the, the guy who wrote the majority of these psalms, he wasn't a sissy. He killed a lion and a bear with a slingshot. Now, once you've done that, then you can criticize him for being too emotional. Letting your emo- dealing with your emotions is manly. It's womanly. It's just mature. It's a way of worshiping God by letting God know honestly what we're actually feeling. So I want to I begin with one of these psalms. We're going to do four sessions on this on different emotions that we experience. And with this one, I want to start with the very first psalm, not Psalm 1. Psalm 1 and 2 are like introduction to the whole book. It's kind of like you read a book and there's an introduction or preface. Okay, we've got the introduction, preface, now it's chapter 1. Our chapter 1 is actually Psalm 3. And in Psalm 3, we're not just reading a song, but we have a title to the psalm that explains what the psalm is all about. It reads like this. A psalm of David when his son fled, or when he fled from his son Absalom. This is the deepest pain of David's life. He's been through a lot of pain. This is the deepest. His son Absalom actually gathered an army, marched on Jerusalem, and this is, blows your mind. His army was stronger than David, so David had to flee. I've walked that exact path that David walked, leaving the city, down the Brook Kidron, across the valley, up the Mount of Olives to the other side. And halfway up the Mount of Olives, he turns, and he's looking down on the city that he built, that his son has taken over, and he wept bitterly. A thousand years later, on that exact same spot, another king would weep. Only this king wasn't fleeing for his life. King Jesus was marching into the city to his death. This is a golden thread that God put between these two stories so that you could know that he is in control of all your stories and all of your emotions. I want to tell you not just about the incident of David fleeing. I want to give you the the backstory that's revealed in this title. And maybe when you read the title, you thought, oh, well, it's in italics. It's not really part of the Bible. It's an editorial comment. Oh, no. The titles of the Psalms are actually in the Hebrew text. In fact, they number them verse 1. So in English, our verse 2 is actually, or verse 1 in Hebrew is actually verse 2. It's that important. Why? Because when you know the backstory of a song, the song just comes to life. And so we want to give a little color commentary by tracing that song. Some of the titles of the Psalms will just tell you the story. Some of them will tell you the details, even what what tune is to be sung with or what instrument, whether it's a gatith or whether it is a a harp or some other instrument, it will, will give you that kind of information. In fact, it will tell you the genre of the music. And there's about six different genres across the Psalms, different styles of music for different preferences of music. But this one is special because in this title, it's it's kind of like you have the biography of David in one hand and the diary of David in another. And as you read the biography in 1 Samuel, you can read how he felt about it here in Psalm 3. The story is a deep one, and I'm going to tell it as quickly as I can, but you got to know it took 11 years for this story to unfold of Absalom chasing his father out of town. 11 years earlier, one of Absalom's half-brothers, David had multiple wives, and so they had a blended family. You think yours is screwed up, you ain't seen nothing. His half-brother Amnon was a tool. He was also heir to the throne, so he got what he wanted. He was spoiled. He felt like he deserves everything. So if he wanted something, he just took it. And one of the things that 
Amnon wanted was Absalom's sister. It was his half, Amnon's half-sister, but she was a looker. And when he looked at her, it was like, oh, I got to have her. Now, I know, ew, but you got to understand, kings in those days, they often intermarried to keep the royal line pure. So he uses his power to get his half-sister into his home. And when she comes, he grabs her hand and pulls her into his bedroom. And she says, oh, brother, don't do this. Don't defile me like this. And she offers. She said, if you ask our father, he will give me to you in marriage. Just don't defile me like this. But he wasn't a patient person. And he took what he wanted. He raped her that day. And as soon as he was done with her, he kicked her out into the street, dishonored, disheveled, and abused. On her way home, she's distraught, obviously. And her brother Absalom finds her. He was fit to be tied. He had blood in his eyes. He wanted vengeance. But you got to be careful. This is the heir to the throne. So he started moving the pieces of the chessboard around so that he could get revenge on Amnon, his half-brother. He was not just mad at Amnon, he was mad at David because King David did nothing, but he was going to do something. So two years later, he finally gets it set up. He gets everyone together. He's going to throw a banquet. It's a, it's a harvest festival. Come to my house. We're going to have a banquet. And everybody came except David. I don't know if he said, I'm too busy for that, or that's not safe to have the king with the whole family. I don't know what his excuse was, but that was a dagger in Absalom's heart, and he never forgave his father for that. Some of you have had that experience with the father that, for whatever reason, simply wasn't able to express love to you. David loved Absalom, and everybody knew that David loved Absalom except Absalom. So when David put a dagger in Absalom's heart, Absalom put a dagger in his brother's heart. He he assassinated the heir to the throne. Of course, when you do that, you're now a fugitive from the law. So he runs into another country. For three years, he was on the run. But he still had powerful allies in the palace. And so eventually, one of his allies spoke to the king, and King David allowed him to come back home. But, David said, he cannot see my face. Why? I think I know, because I've been a dad, and I've made the same mistake, where I, I wanted to teach my kids right and wrong, and I was more concerned about what's wrong and what's right than a right relationship with my kids. I think David made that mistake, and it, it, it crushed Absalom. So so for another two years, Absalom is in the city of Jerusalem, but he can't be face-to-face with his father. If you're counting the years, we're up to seven now. And so for the next four years, Absalom, under his father's nose and behind his father's back, builds an army against King David. And when he was ready, he marched on the city. And King David, he knew when he was bested, and he fled. And that's what this poem is all about. He is expressing to God the deepest hurt of his life. Some of you are right now are going through the deepest hurt of your life. Maybe maybe it was an, an ex that just won't let it go. Or legal proceedings that you thought would be over in months and they've just drug on for years. Or a child that you would do anything to rebuild a relationship with that child, but they're not having any of it. Or maybe he's a friend, they're not talking to you anymore, and you, you don't, for the life of you, you can't figure out what you did wrong. Or maybe it's a marriage that just feels like it is stalled forever. And when you're in the deepest pain, Dave is going to show you a way of sharing your deepest emotions with God so that you can dump them on God and not bring chaos on the people around you. You ready? Here's verse one. Lord, How many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. Selah. What in the world is that? Selah. 
Some of your Bibles put it actually in the footnote. It's in the text. Selah, S-E-L-A-H. A Hebrew word, you know what it means? Actually, neither do I. Nobody knows for sure what it means, but our best guess is because Selah punctuates the psalm. It's all, it's all over the place. And any time you read Selah, I think what's going on is they're saying, time out, stop talking. The music keeps playing, the zither, the harp. The music keeps going, and you just have a moment where you reflect on what you just sang to God. I don't know if you realize, we just did that a few minutes ago. We, we took a pause from the words we were saying so that we could reflect on the meaning of what we just said. So, so how, how's about we do that right now? Well, let's say law for just a minute about this line. How many are my foes? Well, how many foes did David have? Listen, you don't get to be king without making some enemies. And he was a man of bloodshed, and he had done a number of people dirty. That's just the reality of it. So he's got a lot of foes. We actually know a couple of names of foes that helped Absalom take his father out. One of them was Ahithophel. It's a funny name, and you don't need to remember it, but his name was Ahithophel. He was one of David's advisors. Like, he's on the inner circle of David. And he, he betrayed David so that David's son could take over. I don't know what, he, what beef he had against David, but, man, that kind of betrayal cuts deep. And when David learned of it, listen to what David does in response now, David had been told, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. So David prayed, Lord, turn Ahithophel's counsel into foolishness. And God answered his prayer. And here's how. There was another one of David's advisors. His name is Hushai. Again, you don't need to remember the name, but Hushai, he was an old man. He'd been with David for decades. And when David fled, Hushai kind of wobbled out to David and said, David, I'm coming with you. And David goes, look, dude, I, I'm on the run. And, and if I have to watch your back, it's, you're going to get us both killed. What I need you to do is not come with me. What I need you to do is go back to the palace and pretend that you're doing for my son what Ahithophel has done for my son. So, yes, sir, I can do it. And he goes back. And when Absalom calls his first council meeting, there is Hushai right next to Ahithophel. And he said, gentlemen, what should I do? My father's on the run. Should I attack now or should I wait and gather strength? And Ahithophel actually gave good advice. He said, David's on the run. You go get him now. He won't be able to resist you. And Hushai said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. I've been with your dad a long time. Here's what I know about David. He is a wolverine in the wilderness. Dude, you go after him now? Like, he knows that desert like the back of his hand. He knows every, every crook and cranny, every cave, every mountain, every hill. You go after him right now, he will destroy you. What you need to do is go to the other 12 tribes of Israel. Let him know what's going on in the capital city. Get supporters for your regime, and then David will have no quarter to turn to for safety. And Absalom said, that's good advice. And he followed the bad advice of Hushai instead of the good advice of Ahithophel. You know what Ahithophel did? You won't believe this. Well, maybe, maybe you will. Ahithophel, he's, he can't go back to David. He's burned that bridge. And now his new boss isn't listening to him, so he's got no future. So he went out and he hanged himself. There's only two people in all the Bible that hanged themselves. Do you know the name of the other one? Say it out loud if you know it. Judas Iscariot. A thousand years later, the one who betrayed King Jesus hanged himself, and the one who betrayed King David hanged himself. This is, again, the golden thread of God to say, I'm watching. There's nothing going on in your life that he's not aware of. There's no enemy that you have that he hasn't taken account of. We know the enemy of Absalom. We know the enemy of Hithophel. Can I tell you one more real quick? Because this is important. It's just a short little story. As David's leaving the city, some knucklehead started pelting him with rocks. 
Again, he's got a lot of enemies. This guy, his, his name was Shimei. He's a tool. Pelton David with rocks, and this is what Shemai says. Get out, get out, you murderer, you scoundrel. The Lord has repaid you for all the blood you shed in the household of Saul, in whose palace you have reigned. The Lord has given the kingdom into the hands of your son Absalom. You have come to ruin because you are a murderer. Which was not untrue. David was a murderer. He murdered his next door neighbor, one of his dearest friends after he committed adultery with his wife. What he said was true. And that normally would have cut so deep, David would have retaliated on the spot. And you should have been there. Like all David's guard, they've got the hand on the hilt of their sword and they're going, just say the word, man. You just like, just wink and he is, we will mow him down. And David says, no, boys, put, put your swords away. If what Shemaiah is saying is from God, then I receive the discipline of God. If what he is saying is not from God, then God will take care of Shimei. I don't have to. How in the world do you have that much presence of mind to trust God that deeply? Now, I'm asking a real question because some of you right now, again, are, are in the most difficult season of your life. Are you... Are you ready to just let it go? Are you ready to just turn a blind eye to what they did? No, listen, David is not turning a blind eye. David is not letting it go. He is lifting it up and saying, God, you have to do this. And the beauty of letting God be your defender is that he's way better at it than you. If you want vengeance on someone, don't do it yourself. God has way more power. If you want vengeance on someone, you don't have the self-control to moderate that. God does. How did David come to the place where he could just give it to God? If you go back to the end of verse 2, there's an Easter egg there that I want to unpack. It says, many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. A literal translation is, he has no savior. There was no one to save. And this word here, deliver him, I'm going to actually pronounce that. You want to learn a little Hebrew today? I'm going to pronounce the Hebrew word because some of you will recognize this word. It is, he has no Yeshua. That's the name for Joshua. Joshua means the Lord saves. I named my son Joshua because when, when we got pregnant, like I knew I couldn't do it. I needed the Lord to save me before I could raise a son. This name is deep for me. It was deep for David. And if you take the word Joshua and pull it into the New Testament, here's how it sounds. Jesus. Jesus' name means Yahweh or the Lord saves. And if people are saying of David, he has has no Jesus. And David's going, no, I've got a Savior, and I know that I have a Savior. And when you know that you have a Savior, you don't have to be your own Savior. That makes all the difference. Because you're not really capable of the vengeance that is either appropriate or sufficient. But man, when you can give it to God, what a difference that will make for you and everyone else around you. How in the world can you give it to God? This is what this message is all about. How you can be completely honest with God. Because sometimes those of us who are powders, we just like, I'm gonna let it go. No, don't let it go, give it to God. Give full vent and full fury to the range of emotions that you have with God because he already, he, he already knows where you are and what you're feeling. But if you can vent it to God, you can give it to God. And so I, I just want to show you what happens in David's life, what happens when he wrestles with God. He's not shy about his frustration, his anger. He wrestles with God. And when you wrestle with God, You don't have to wrestle with yourself. Part of the problem that I have with anger, when I get angry, 
is not when people tell lies about me, it's when people tell truths about me. When people expose my failure or my sin, my shame, man, I write, and I'll do anything to deny it. I'll point out their flaws and I'll run from it, I'll duck under it. David didn't do that. And here's why. He was able to allow God's view of him to be his view of him. Listen to verse three. You, O Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. And I want to just land on three words here. The word shield, it's so picturesque. Their shields were about this big around, kind of a wooden frame with animal skins layered on top of it. That would keep arrows from piercing it, and swords would glance off of it. God promised to be our shield. David is claiming a promise God already made, and God made it not to David. Actually, God made it hundreds of years earlier to the father of the nation, Abraham, where God said, I will be your shield. This is a promise that still stands true, and it stands true for you. If you need a shield, God is at the ready saying, just put me in front of you, and I will deflect what's coming at you. He's not just a shield, he is our glory. That's a heavy word. Right, literally, the Hebrew word means heavy, kavod. It was used to describe that thick cloud that directed the Israelites through the desert. That same thick cloud hovered over Mount Sinai when God gave the Ten Commandments. It is a, a dense cloud. That cloud landed and settled in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle of God. This is the thick, rich, palpable presence of God. And when you have that, that changes the way you deal with yourself, and that changes the way you deal with other people. But this last description is my favorite. He lifts my head. David knew what that meant, because he's a king. And when you approach a king, you know how to approach a king, right? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you, in case you ever approach a king, here's the proper way. You bow your head and you kneel. And you put your eyes to the ground because now your head is in perfect chopping position. Because if the king doesn't receive you, you're done. But if he does receive you, you will feel his fingers underneath your chin and he lifts your chin so that you can look in the king's eyes. And when God lifts your chin and you see him for who he is, suddenly you see yourself through his eyes, not through the eyes of your enemy, not through the eyes that you see in the mirror, not through the eyes of your past or your pain. You will see yourself as a child of God, fallen, absolutely. You, you got failures, absolutely. But the eyes of a father look differently, and they see you differently than you see yourself. And if you could just see yourself the way God sees you right now, you wouldn't have to take the same kind of vengeance. You wouldn't have to fight Ahithophel or Absalom or Shimei. You would let God be your defender because he's better at it than you. Man, when you, when you wrestle with God, you don't have to wrestle with yourself. And when you wrestle with God, you don't have to wrestle with sleep. A third of Americans, American adults, a third are sleep deprived. Not because we're too busy, but because we're too preoccupied. We're letting things rattle around in our brains that we, we can't drop them but you can lift them to God. And if you'll give it to God, you'll sleep it better. Look, David is in a desert. His pillow is a rock. His canopy is a cave. And here's what he says. I lie down and sleep. I wake up again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. That's not a metaphor. That's actually what was happening when David wrote this, pe this poem. He penned it in a cave. Probably got up one in the morning and, oh, okay, God, it's going to be a great day. Tens of thousands trying to kill me, but I see you and you see me. It's going to be a great day. 
If you can wrestle with God, you won't have to wrestle with sleep. And if you wrestle with God, you won't have to wrestle with others. See, we're so spun up about what he did and what she said and how I can get him back and how we can make this right. There's a, there's a part of you that is justly concerned about justice. There's another part of you that, man, you're just not seeing yourself clearly. And if you can't see yourself clearly, how are you going to see someone else clearly? What I'm about to read, some of you are not going to like. And that's too bad. <laughs> David says, arise, Lord. That's a battle cry. When you get your sword and shield and you're marching to battle, you say, arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. Whoo. That's violent. That's like NC-17 violent. And people say, see, that's why I don't like the Bible. It's so full of violence. You, stop it. Do you know who David is talking about here? It's in the title of the psalm. He's talking about his son, Absalom. He's saying, God, take care of that boy. He's a rat. You, you do dirty to him. God. He's just letting God have it. He's venting his full rage at God. But you know what David did in real life? He said it was to his commanders, don't touch my son. Don't touch my son. How can he be so violent with his words with God and so passive with his son? Because when you give vent to your fury with God, you don't have to vent your fury with your fists. This is so brilliant. And it's been sitting in the Bible all our lives, this tool for being honest with God. Because God, in worship, whether we're singing as a group together or whether you're in your home in a private prayer closet, when you worship God, that's a safe space for complete honesty with your feelings. You can vent there all you want. As long as you feel his fingers under your chin, your venting will be safe. Because if you can see him, then you can see you in a different light. When we wrestle with God, we don't have to wrestle with ourselves, we don't have to wrestle with sleep, we don't have to wrestle with others. We can. We're not dropping it. We're not letting our pain go. We're lifting our pain up to the proper place. And only then can we get to verse 8. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. As you notice that, this is not about David. This is about God's people. And the reason it's so important for you and for me to really be honest with our emotions with God in worship is because in the safe space of worship, we can deal with the turmoil of our emotions so that it doesn't spill out inappropriately on the people who are around us. So I wanna practice another Selah moment with you. When you came in, if you got one of these communion emblems, we're gonna take communion today together. And, and I just want to practice this Selah where you say to God, whatever is on your heart, but it becomes a safe space, even for violent rhetoric, it becomes a safe place because you hold in your hand a piece of bread that represents the broken body of Jesus. Say whatever you want, as violent as you want to be, as distraught as you want to be, because this puts whatever else you hold in this hand in perfect perspective. And if you take this, you can lift this to God. T take a moment right now, just in your own heart, speak to God about what's on your heart. Lord, in this safe space of worship, we know that the pain you went through on our behalf trumps any pain by 10,000 that we have in our lives. We don't deny the pain we have. 
And we're not letting it go, but we want to give it to you because you have given us your son and it's his broken body that can heal ours. We pray in his name, amen. The body of Christ broken for you. And we take the cup that represents the shed blood of Jesus. I want to give you a moment to say to God what you want him to do for you, for your enemy, for that person that you're at odds with. And it's a safe space to do that because as you say to God, here's what I want, here's what I want you to do, you hold in your hand what he's already done. And as he's poured out his blood for you, you can be poured out for others. Tell them what's on your heart. Lord, we know that you are a God of justice because you sent your own son to die for our sins. And in that act of righteousness, we recognize that if our Lord could suffer for our sins, and we're not the right person to retaliate against others, we give judgment and justice and mercy into your hands. And with that, we thank you for this cup, a symbol of his blood in the name of Jesus. Amen. The blood of Christ poured out for you. I hope you feel free to share with God what's really on your heart. And for some of you, it's going to require a conversation with a family member or maybe with someone at work. Or maybe it's that you just stop the action that you were planning on. But if you see God for who he is in worship, then you'll see yourself clearly, and then you can see others clearly. May this bring a blessing on our whole church and on our entire city. Guys, we'll see you next week. God bless.